Hello to everyone from around the world and welcome to today's webinar, Migrating from 8-Bit to 32-Bit MCUs with NXP LPC 1200, brought to you by NXP and EE Times. We have just a few short announcements before we begin. This webinar is designed to be interactive, so please ask questions at any time during the presentation by typing them in the text area and clicking the Submit button. Our presenters will answer your questions at the end of this webinar, but please enter them whenever they come to mind. Later in the program, we will ask you to complete a short survey. Please take a moment to fill this out and submit it. Your feedback is important to us and will provide NXP and EE Times with valuable information on the subjects covered in this webinar and how we can improve future broadcasts. The survey will open for you at the beginning of the Q&A session. Additionally, you can launch the feedback form by using the survey button. And now, on to the presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce Chris Guarneri, Field Applications Engineer at NXP, and Keith Walters, also a Field Applications Engineer at NXP. Welcome, Chris and Keith. I'll now hand it over to Chris to start the presentation. All right. Thank you very much. Well, welcome, everyone. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us for our webinar. Again, NXP 8-bit to 32-bit migration with Cortex-M0 microcontrollers. Uh, this is a continuing presentation from us. Uh, we had done one earlier in the year, similar theme on our LPC 1100, and now we're continuing on with the 1200 family. So we'll take a look at our agenda for today. Uh, an overview of the LPC 1200, again, Cortex-M0 microcontroller, and also a device comparison. Today we'll be comparing the 1200 against the Atmel AVR 8-bit microcontroller family. And so we'll compare things like the performance and code density of the two devices, power and cost, and then we'll also look at a migration example going from AVR and 8-bit up to 32-bit Cortex-M0, and at the end, question and answer. Uh, in the background today, we do have a number of our applications engineers that are answering your questions as they come in, so ask away. So when we look at the LPC-1200 family, this family is what we call our industrial control series. And you say, why industrial control series? It could certainly be used in any application, but there are certainly some things that lend itself very well to industrial applications. Uh, as we noted, this is a true 32-bit Cortex-M0 microcontroller running at a top speed of 30 megahertz. Uh, we have up to 128K of flash. And with the flash on this device, we do offer smaller page erase sizes, so you can use that for things like virtual EEPROM storage. Uh, multiple UARTs, of course, UART is staple in industrial controls and many designs around the world. Comparators, real-time clock, and watchdog. So we'll introduce some more uh, detail on these features. So we have, of course, the link for more information on the LPC-1200. If we look at the uh, memory, the flash memory, 32 to 128K of flash. So these are all pin-compatible devices. So one of the great things is if you don't need more memory, you can move down to smaller memory sizes, thus saving cost. The other advantage there is, as we all know in our designs, we tend to be very aggressive in trying to shoehorn everything into the smallest memory footprint, but there's always the ubiquitous marketing people out there who want to add more features at the end, sometimes driving up our memory requirements. So you also have a path up to larger devices, again, without having to redesign or change memory footprint, or excuse me, package footprint. Uh, SRAM on the device, 2 to, K, 2 to 8K of SRAM. One of the other features that we added with this family is a ROM feature. So if you look on the, uh, the blocks, you have flash, SRAM, and ROM. This is true masked ROM. And one of the things that NXP has been doing is leveraging masked ROM to include 
features such as our bootloader. So there's always a way to get code into the device. And on the LPC 1200, we introduced a first ever hardware or software ROMed divider library. Also included in this family is DMA and CRC. So oftentimes CRCs are required for communications protocols, verifying that the data is correct. Rather than doing that all in software, this is now managed in hardware. We also have timers and up to 55 GPIO in a 64-pin package device. If we continue to look at the peripheral block, some of the other features that we see on this family, 10-bit, 8-channel, A to D converter, and that A to D is a 400 kilosample per second. Also included are two comparators. Uh, the analog comparator block on this family is very flexible uh, and includes things like a programmable internal reference divider. So you can hook it up to your VDD rail and then divide down the actual reference internally, so not needing an external VREF then. Also included, the UARTs, as we mentioned before. One of the nice things about the UARTs on these devices is it does support the RS-485 mode, 9-bit. Uh, also included is ERDA mode. And we do have full modem for anyone that needs that on one of the UARTs. In addition to the UARTs, we have the typical SPI and I2C interfaces. The windowed watchdog feature is something that is often required in different types of industrial applications and in white goods. So the IEC 60730 Class B certification is uh, one of the things that we strive for with the windowed watchdog and have achieved that certification. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the windowed watchdog timer, basically what you do with this device is you can configure both a high and low limit timeout. So traditionally, a watchdog typically just will time out if you don't kick it within a certain time, say 100 milliseconds. So 100 milliseconds elapses. We haven't done anything to the watchdog. So that's an indication to the system that our code has gone rogue, potentially. So we want to restart. With a windowed watchdog, there's actually a second criteria set that says if we kick too often, that's also an indication that our code has gone rogue. So for example, you could say, I want a minimum of 10 milliseconds and a maximum of 100 milliseconds. And anything earlier than that or later than that is considered you know, unacceptable, code has gone rogue, we'll reset. And of course, if you want to use the watchdog in the non-windowed mode, you still have that option. In addition to the windowed watchdog, another feature that suits itself very well for industrial applications is the digital filters on all of the I.O. So with the I.O., you can actually configure basically a, a glitch filter, and you can program that for the number of cycles that you need a state to be present on the pin. And that's configurable, as mentioned. Uh, included in this, of course, 12 megahertz internal RC oscillator. And this is trimmed to 1%. And that is over temperature and over voltage. So this is a very good internal RC oscillator and can oftentimes be used as your main clock source. This is advantageous because then you don't need to, of course, add external circuitry like an external oscillator thus saving space and cost. One of the other features with the 1200 family is it's designed for rapid derivative development. So we will very soon be introducing a version of this device that has an onboard 40 by 4 segment LCD display driver. Also with this, we have the option to add additional features like additional UARTs, SPI, uh, also potentially a metrology engine. So we have the ability to add more to this device uh, depending on what your needs are and, of course, what volumes would be. So as I mentioned, 
we have very high reliability with this device and specifically targeted the industrial market. One of the things that we've done in addition to the watchdog and the glitch filters is we've independently sought out and tested this device against many of the standards that people designing in the machine environment need to adhere to. So for example, the fast transient test. We've actually submitted the device to an independent test house and they verified that this device does in fact stand up to EFT testing. Also ESD testing, so 4KV direct contact, 8KV air discharge is a very common standard that industrial machinery needs to meet. And of course, all of the devices are industrial operating temperature, minus 40 to plus 85. So as I mentioned at the outset, we were gonna compare against a popular 8-bit family. So what we did is we looked at the Atmel AVR family and looked for a device that had similar feature sets. And so what we ended up doing was choosing the ATX Mega 128A3. This is actually one of the higher end X Mega devices that are available from Atmel. So if we look very closely, it has 128K of onboard flash and 8K of SRAM, similar to the 1200, has a maximum operation speed of 32 megahertz. Again, very similar to the LPC 1200. This device is a 64 pin package, has onboard comparators, A to Ds, timers, spies and UARTs, and also DMA. So this was a very close comparison for us. So now what we're actually going to do is take a close look at the work we did in comparing an 8-bit application and a 32-bit application. And so as we do this, what we want to do is compare the pillars of a microcontroller design. So typically when we're looking at a design, things we're concerned about, the performance of the device, how much memory is it gonna consume, how much power is it gonna consume, how much is it gonna cost me, and of course, what is my path? How do I design it? How long is it going to take? If I'm in an architecture now and I need to move to a new architecture, what do I need to be aware of? What are the things that I'm going to encounter? And how can I ensure success for myself, my company, and the future of my product and design? So these are the pillars that we'll explore. So in order to set the stage for the work we did, we need to talk about Cormark. What is Cormark? Cormark is a benchmark utility. Uh, it's similar, um, most people I believe have heard of DMIPS. Cormark does something similar but goes beyond what just DMIPS can offer us. Cormark actually allows us to port the code to many platforms and look at more than just math performance. So with Cormark we see that we will do things like linked list operations with data structures and pointer manipulation something very common in a typical application. We will do some math, matrix operations, 16 and 32-bit integer math. In addition to that, there is a CRC calculation involved in Cormark, and then also state machine control. This is something every piece of code out there does. Every control system manipulates if statements and branching and, and moving throughout the code so this is where Cormark again adds, um, adds to what DMIPS could traditionally offer. Some notes about Cormark, it is all written in C and the particular test that we ran requires 2K of SRAM. So all of these data structures are contained in the SRAM and that again is about 2K. Another nice feature about Cormark that we will see later when we get into the comparison is it is self-checking. And this becomes very important in verifying that 
the work that we did and the work that the CPU does is in fact accurate. And we'll explain during our experiments how that uh, manifested itself as we were getting incorrect results, which eventually led us to uncover some, some interesting things. And the great thing about Cormark is it is free. You can download it from cormark.org and run it on your processor. So using Cormark, we'll actually take a look at compiled code. So what we have here, side by side, the identical function. So this is a very simple function, copy info. We take a couple of pointer inputs and just copy the information from one location to another. So setting up some data moves down the line. And what we can see with this code comparison is on the left-hand side, we have the LPC-1200, our Cortex-M0. That is the code that is generated. It's approximately, uh, what do we have there, 15, 20 instructions to move the data. Looking at the AVRX Mega, the identical code takes almost twice as many instructions to execute. So we can see right off the bat that the Cortex-M0 is much more efficient in terms of manipulating data. And just incidentally, for those who are wondering, is this a fair comparison? Would, what are we using for a compiler? So for this, yes, it is a fair comparison. We use the identical compiler, GCC version 4.3.3, with optimization turned off. So this truly is an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of code generation. Taking this one step further, we'll look at one additional example. So here we have an actual line of C source code where we're doing 32-bit multiplication. Actually, we're starting out with a 16-bit multiply in A and B, and then we'll summation into C, which is 32-bit. And so once again, if we look at the LPC-1200 on the left-hand side, we can see the instructions generated to do this one line of C source code. So we can see lots of data moves. There are five multiplies in this string of code to generate the result. Moving over to the right-hand side with the X mega, again, the exact same line of code, the same compiler, the same optimization. Here we can see, well, you probably can't see because I had to shrink the font unbelievably small to make it all fit on the slide, but it ends up being approximately three times as many assembly instructions and in addition to just the assembly, we have a 32-bit multiply library call that gets thrown into the mix. So one of the things that we hadn't previously mentioned is the Cortex-M0 is capable of doing a 32 by 32-bit multiply in hardware in single instruction. In the AVR, it does have a hardware multiply, but that's a 16 by 16. When we move it over to a 32-bit, it has to call a library function. So thus we can see, once again, the 32-bit architecture is far more efficient than traditional 8-bit. So we take this one step further, and we do a comparison of actual code so once again, these are the project sizes that we generated. So the first one, the LPC-1200, this was compiled on an actual board with the debugger using the GCC compiler 4.3.3 without optimization. On the right-hand side, we see the XMega also real compiled code that was downloaded and verified on actual hardware. And we can see that the LPC-1200 code is significantly smaller. 
And this surprises a lot of people. Uh, we've, we've talked at length about how the Cortex-M0 is much more efficient at generating smaller density source code than 8-bit micros, and it's hard to believe. 8-bit, you would think, is more efficient. You're only storing 8 bits of data at a time. However, most systems no longer deal with just 8-bit data. As we saw in the earlier slides, these micros have A to Ds that are greater than 8-bit. So you're automatically dealing with a 16-bit piece of data right there. So in an 8-bit architecture, such as the AVR, you're dealing with double moves for everything. And then when you start doing multiplies and summations, say if you were doing filtering, you're jumping up into 32-bit, which then necessitates quad moves for the 8-bit architecture, whereas the 32-bit Cortex-M0 can handle 8, 16, and 32 all in one instruction. So again, this is total project. So what we're looking at is no optimization. This includes all of the core mark benchmarking, but this also includes other code. So this is startup code. This is things to get the clocks up and running, PLLs running. Uh, of course, we had to verify that hardware was actually working, so we had the ubiquitous Blinky to verify that we had you know, something running on the boards and then some additional test points so we could verify that things were running at the correct speed. So then the next thing we did is, okay, we've looked at no optimization. What happens if we go full optimization? We let the compiler do everything it possibly can to squeeze the code down. That's the only change to this project. And we can see that the LPC-1200 is still much smaller than the 8-bit micro, the AVR. So now we're at 13K versus 22K. So our 32-bit micro saves us 9K of code for the same application, the same compiler. So that's pretty significant savings, and again, it, it seems difficult to believe, and we went to great rigor to verify that we were, in fact, comparing apples to apples. That's why we use the same compiler. That's why we use CoreMark, so we get the same code base and the same results. Now, I did mention that this is all for the complete project. So if we drill down just a little deeper and compare just function by function, and actually I should say file by file, these are some of the actual core mark files. And what we see is there's a core matrix, core list join, core state, and an EE printf. So I'll talk a little bit more about what each of these is doing. Core matrix is basically doing matrix multiplication operations. So this is a way for CoreMark to verify what is actually happening when manipulating matrices and doing multiplications and summations. So again, here, if we look at these side by side, we see with and without optimization, the LPC-1200 generates code that's 50%, actually greater than 50% smaller. 1,800 bytes versus 4,200 bytes. That's a very significant savings. And if we turn the optimizer completely on, 1,040 bytes versus 2,088. So very different code size. Moving on to core list join, we can see very similar savings. Core state. Core state is a good one because core state is actually the benchmarking feature that does all of the if and branching and case statement manipulation. And that's where most applications spend most of their time, branching through code, making decisions. And even here we can see that, again, the Cortex-M0 is significantly smaller in code, uh, about half the size in some cases. 
And then EEPrintF is just what it says. It's a printf, but it's a, a reduced size printf, which works very well for embedded systems. So here with EEPrintF, where we're not doing math, we can see that, again, Cortex M0 LPC 1200 code that's greater than half the size in, in some cases, or close to half the size. 2776 without the optimizer versus 4932. Turning on full optimization, 1432 versus 2522. So very significant, over a K of code savings, even with the optimizer cranked up. Another very unique feature where we save code space is in the ROM divide library. So at the outset, we talked about the fact that we have this on-chip ROM available to us. With this ROM, we can put various functions. Again, I mentioned we have our NXP bootloader in there. So anytime the chip starts up, it'll run the bootloader. So you can always get code into the device. Aside from the bootloader, we also have the ability to put functions like this divide library. So one of the things you would say is, well, why would you put a divide library in ROM? Well, first of all, these processors do not have a hardware divide. So the AVRX Mega does not, and the Cortex-M0 does not have a hardware divide. So that's one thing. Any divide operation will include a divide library. The divide library oftentimes will take up to 1K of code space or more, depending on optimization. The other thing about divides are they are not very deterministic in terms of their execution speed. Traditionally, a divide library will continuously look at the operand and the dividend to see, or divisor and dividend, I should say, and see if it needs to end early, which gives a wide range of divide cycle time results. So what NXP did is took the divide library and made it very deterministic. So typically with divide, you have unsigned, signed, unsigned with remainder, and signed with remainder. So these are integer divide routines, not floating point. And we can see the cycle times for each one. So unsigned and unsigned will take us 82 cycles. Signed, both being positive, 85 cycles. Signed with one or both being negative, 97 cycles. So here we can see our divide library is very deterministic. 82 versus 97 cycles is a nice tight window to know how long is it going to take our divide. And as I mentioned, we save about 1K of code space. In this particular example, if we turn up the optimization, we saved, uh, I believe it was approximately 978 or 980 some bytes, so pretty close to 1K of code. So again, this is another opportunity to save code space. One of the nice things about the divide library as implemented is if you don't want to use these, you don't have to. You can very easily just leave the compiler alone, and it will automatically include the library files. If you don't want to use the library files from the compiler, there are directives built into the compiler that will allow you to override and then use the ROM dividers. So very easy to implement or not implement. So now we've looked quite a bit at code size. Now, code size is important, but it's not everything. The other thing we have to look at here is what type of performance are we getting out of the processor? Now, most people expect a 32-bit micro should get better performance than an 8-bit. But how much better? So this is one thing that Cormark will tell us. So if we look at the results here, this is an actual generated output of Cormark from our microcontroller running on our target platform. So we hooked it up to a UART. These are the screen dumps that we get from each one of those. 
As we can see on the left, the LPC 1200 running at 12 megahertz doing the 2K performance test took us 12 seconds to complete the entire test. In that time, we did 16 iterations per second and did 200 iterations. Again, we note the compiler version and the compiler flags. So now here we cranked up the compiler to O3 optimization. We want to see how fast we can go. We know with the optimizer turned off, things will be slower than this. So we really want to see how fast, how good can we be. And then I noted, noted earlier on that CoreMark is self-verifying. So if we look down at the bottom of this list, we see CRC list and then a number, CRC matrix, CRC state, and CRC final. CoreMark checks these. So as it runs the test, it also checks the CRC. If this data does not come back correct, it will be noted in CoreMark and you know you have an invalid test. So when we ran this, everything was good. And then we moved over to the X-Mega. Again, the X-Mega, for purposes of an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, we ran that at 12 megahertz also. The test took 19 seconds to complete on the X-Mega and was capable of only doing five iterations per second and 110 total iterations. Now with this, one thing you might notice is the total ticks are not the same. Total ticks are completely processor dependent. Total ticks is basically whatever time base we establish to be able to feed CoreMark so that it can measure the lapse of time. So the actual ticks versus time elapsed are not correlated from one processor to one processor. The nice thing about the LPC 1200, all of the timers for this test we used were 32-bit. Actually, we leveraged the Cortex-M0 system tick timer, so 32-bit. So we set it up to run at a 1 megahertz speed. On the X Mega side, we didn't have that luxury of a 32-bit timer that we could just run. So we had to come up with some schemes where we were doing some clock divides, so therefore the ticks do not match. However, the speed and the means for measuring time are the same, so this is a valid comparison. Uh, also, as noted, with the CRC, when we were dealing with the AVR code, uh, at first we weren't getting the correct CRC information. So this was an opportunity to really dig into the AVR tools and also kind of go through and see what the 8-bit machine was doing. And at the end of the day, we realized that the compiler and the way it was handling uh, promotions and, and pointers, there needed to be some work, which Keith will elaborate to a little bit more a little later on. Needless to say, we got it remedied and we have a true comparison. Now we're going to beat this one just a little bit more just to show you, okay, let's take it one step further. Let's go to 24 megahertz. So at 24 megahertz, we see that our iterations per second on the LPC 1200 goes up to 33, whereas on the X mega, we're at 11. Now keep in mind these processors go to 33 and 32 megahertz respectively. So if we put this in bar graph form, which is always much easier to compare two items, we can see the LPC 1200 has a 3 to 1 performance advantage at the same speed. This is very significant. And the reason it's significant, A, if we're designing a processor, and we, we talked about that marketing group that loves to throw things at us at the end of a design cycle, not only do we have migration paths to handle more code space and handle the features, we have more bandwidth available to us. Because we get more work done much faster, we can handle those last second requests. So now we've looked at the 
code size and we've looked at performance. Now we'll shift gears and look at power and cost. So again, just a reminder, we're looking at our pillars of design. We've addressed performance, we've addressed code density, so now on to the next facet of our comparison. So what we did for the power comparison is we kept it very simple. We looked at the data sheet. Yes, we had boards. We had code actually running on boards. I actually have them sitting right here on my bench side by side. But comparing power consumption on development boards is a challenge, to say the very least. Uh, isolating power gets to be very difficult. There are LEDs all over. There are connectors everywhere. Um, it was just hard to isolate power. So therefore, we decided, let's just take these at face value from the data sheets. So what we see in the data sheet is a comparison of the run current. What we see is both processors running at maximum speed, 3.3 volts, 25 degrees C. Again, from the data sheet, we see the LPC 1200 is 8 milliamps of current consumption at 33 megahertz. Looking at the ATX Mega, we're at 18 milliamps of current consumption at 32 megahertz for the same voltage and same temperature. So we can see just by this simple comparison, 32-bit wins out again. We actually get more work done and we consume less power. So one of the great things here is we're already better than two to one on power consumption savings with the LPC 1200, but we also know that we get three times as much work done. So therefore, in theory, we could take our clock and run it not at 32 mega, or excuse me, 33 megahertz, but we could run it down to say 11 megahertz. That would give us the same performance as the X mega running at full speed, but now we're going to save even more current. So that 8.1 would go down to somewhere in the 4 or 3 milliamp current consumption. So 32 bit is definitely looking very positive for us, is it not? Another thing that we want to compare is price. So this should be where the 8-bit shines, right? We're comparing a true 32-bit microcontroller against an 8-bit microcontroller. Well, 8-bit has to be less expensive. It's smaller, right? Well, for our comparison, we kept it very simple. We went to DigiKey. Most of us have visited and ordered parts from DigiKey before. And we took a look at their single piece price. Now granted, usually the single piece price is not what we use for production, but the price tends to scale the same. So looking at single piece price, LPC 1227, 64 pin QFP, $6.50. The ATX Mega 128 A3, 64 pin QFP, $10.43. Our LPC 1200 32-bit micro with more performance, less power, and very comparable peripherals is saving us almost $4 at one piece price. So imagine what it can do at volume. Take a look at the piece price for the development systems very comparable. So an AVR X Mega Explained board, which we ran our tests on, is about $30. The LPC Expresso LPC 1227 board is $22.50, so very comparable. So the notion that ARM is much more expensive uh, from a development tool, among other things, is not the case. If we look at JTAG Debugger, for our experiments, we purchased an AVR Dragon board, which was $52. For the LPC 1200 family, 
the debugger was free. It's actually part of the Expresso board. And then if we look at the compilers, AVR Studio is free. LPC Expresso, which uses the same GCC compiler, is free up to 128K of code, which covers certainly our needs. And note there is an upgrade path. So now what I'd like to do is turn it over to my colleague Keith Walters, and he's going to take us through migrating from the AVR to the LPC 1200. Keith? Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, so folks, uh, the next portion of our uh, presentation here is we're going to cover the migration path from an 8-bit microcontroller to a 32-bit microcontroller. Now, for those of you who have not had a great deal of experience with 32 micros in the past, um, there may be some concerns as to the complexity of the migration. And in the past, most 32-bit micros are either very large pin count devices, um, maybe ran like an operating system, something like that, had tons and tons of pins, or if they did come in the smaller packages, they lack some of the features that you would typically find in an 8-bit microcontroller. Um, with the introduction of the Cortex series, and especially the Cortex-M0, this is really no longer the case. The Cortex-M0 was specifically designed with C in mind. There's been a number of uh, software uh, endeavors uh, started by ARM in order to kind of mask the difficulties in getting maybe these parts started up. Uh, so the startup code is handled by uh, built-in drivers, uh, things like that. So really, right out of the gate, you can start developing your application code without having to worry about the low-level uh, startup uh, routines that you typically had to with some of the previous generations of 32-bit microcontrollers. So kind of looking at an uh, example application, uh, what we're looking at here is a hypothetical ultrasonic distance measure. So for the user interface, what we have here is a segmented LCD driver and a keypad, which is being scanned by GPIO in an XY matrix. On the driver, for the transducer is a PWM-driven device, uh, and then the ranging is handled by an analog comparator. Uh, we also have incorporated a uh, temperature sensor. Perhaps this is measuring the temperature of the transducer itself, making sure it's not overdriven, things like that. And so this is kind of this combination of digital and analog peripherals has been in the past sort of the uh, shining point for most of the 8-bit micros that are out there today. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove the 8-bit microcontroller, and in its place, what we're going to add is the Cortex-M0. So as you can see, we have all the exact same digital peripherals in place. We have the I2C and the SPI. We also have the GPIO to do the keypad scan. We have the PWM generators, the analog comparators, the A to D converters. So pretty much the, the entire peripheral set is still there. Um, what we do have available to us now, and Chris had alluded to this earlier, was the fact that we have a much higher performance core. Uh, with a code density improvement of nearly 2 to 1, you can go with a smaller Cortex-70. So the 1227, you can go with the 1225, which is half the flash memory. Therefore, you get additional cost savings. Um, you could either go with triple the performance at the same clock speed, or if you want to, you can downclock the device and save additional current. Now, with reducing of the additional current, you may be able to realize additional system cost savings. So for instance, you can go with either a smaller buck converter or you can maybe reduce the buck converter to a simple LDO, uh, therefore generating additional savings as well. So, um, and as Chris also alluded to earlier, the issue of feature creep. I'm sure we've all worked on programs before where your boss comes in and say, well, we'd like to drive a high resolution LCD. We'd like to have a larger keypad, maybe add another transducer, things like that. Well, with the 32-bit microcontroller, you have the performance available in order to add those features without really having to significantly relay, relay out the board. Um, you have plenty of room for performance and also you have plenty of room for additional code if you need it. So really the LPC 1227, gives you this room for expansion that uh, you will eventually need as marketing requirements grow over time of the, of the program. 
Now, as far as the ease of use issue, and you know, we've talked about this a little bit, um, how is the M0 easier to use than other 32-bit microcontrollers that have been out there in the past? Well, we do have extensive support um, by our operating systems, uh, free RTOS, things like that, also uh, software tool chains as well. Um, the Cortex family in and of itself is really designed specifically for the embedded market space. And so what you get is you get deterministic um, execution of instruction code as well as uh, deterministic execution of interrupt routines. In the past, most 32-bit microcontrollers had uh, interrupt handling times between 26 to 42 cycles or so. Uh, in the Cortex-M0, it's 16 uh, cycles to handle an interrupt. Um, additionally, all uh, instructions are executed within three clock cycles through a three-stage pipeline. Um, another thing also is in the past, most 32-bit microcontrollers required the implementation of the startup code and the interrupt handling routines all in assembly. So you had to get really down deep into 32-bit assembly code. With the Cortex series, what they've done is they've uh, re-architected the core to allow the writing of interrupt handling routines and startup code in C. So this makes it much, much easier, much more portable in order to implement. And that is really enabled by something called CMSYS. Now, CMSYS is the Cortex Microcontroller Software Interface Standard. This is an initiative started out by ARM, and it's designed to make code portability between Cortex devices offered by a number of different vendors much easier. And what it incorporates is a common vernacular in order to describe certain key functions of the device. So, for instance, CMSYS wrapper allows any vendor to implement the interrupt vector handler in essentially the same syntax. So the syntax for writing it for one Cortex device from one vendor is the exact same syntax for another vendor um, as well. Also a similar syntax for the system timers, things like that. Future iterations of CMSYS will also incorporate a common wrapper for talking to peripherals as well, such as UARTs. Um, I squared C, SPI, things like that. So really, it's trying to make the code porting and code maintainability of uh, code written for Cortex OS much simpler for, uh, and also much more well supported across uh, a number of different uh, vendors. Um, also, the big thing to uh, really kind of push here is the simplicity of the assembly language routines that are in the core. So a Cortex M0 has 56 assembly um, instructions in its core. Uh, the X-Mega has up to 138 instructions. So really, when you're looking at a RISC processor, the M0 is more true to that standard of being a truly reduced instruction set um, um, device. Now, taking a closer look at the MCU core and the registers that are available, as you can see, uh, there are 13 32-bit wide general purpose registers available for the M0, and this is primarily where most of the arithmetic operations happen. There are a few special purpose registers too, such as the link register, stack pointer, program counter, and the program status register. In the X-Mega, there are a considerably larger number of smaller registers there. Uh, there are up to 32 general purpose registers. And one of the limiting factors that you're going to find in most 8-bit microcontrollers is the issue of addressing large memory spaces. So for the 8-bit AVR, to access program memory above 120, well, 128K bytes or data memory above 64K bytes, they need to append additional registers onto the pointers. So registers 26 and 27 can be combined to form a 16-bit pointer. But to access data above 64K bytes, you need to append a third register, the ramp X register, in order to access these larger memory spaces. This is pretty much true over any of the pointers that are available to the 8-bit uh, microcontroller. Um, for the Cortex-M0, all 32-bit registers, the Cortex-M0 has up to 4 gigabytes of addressable space, all without the use of special registers required in order to access that additional memory space. So it makes the pointer arithmetic, the pointer handling, uh, that kind of, those kinds of operations a much simpler much more convenient uh, thing to implement. Now, as far as development tools are, 
are concerned, uh, firmware development in particular. Um, we're going to kind of compare what is available for the Cortex um, offering as well as the Atmel 8-bit offering. So, for instance, if you are interested in using an open source compiler such as GCC, uh, the Cortex series is uh, supported by that. We do have uh, GCC tools called LPC Expresso developed um, by uh, Code Red. There's also Hitex available. Atmel has the AVR Studio along with WinAVR. Both are GCC based tools. Um, both microcontroller architectures are supported by IAR, so um, if you do have a um, interest in using IAR tools, both are supported as well. Uh, both are supported by Rowley as well. And then there are also other proprietary compilers as well. Um, the Cortex series is supported by Kyle, which is an ARM-owned company. Um, the proprietary uh, ImageCraft is available for Atmel. Um, also kind of a different offering compared to the Atmel offering is the online compilers. So we do have an online compiler called Embed, which is uh, driven by a Kyle compiler and you simply open it up in the uh, Internet Explorer shell, and you can develop code, download hex files, and directly program your devices all over the Internet. So it's kind of a different offering available that doesn't uh, require you to install any extensive tool chains. Um, as far as peripheral drivers are concerned, um, there is a common driver library combined with CMSYS that's available for the Cortex M0 series. And then for uh, the AVR, uh, devices, there's the AVR software framework. Real-time operating systems, pretty much the same offering as well, FreeRTOS, Micrium, uh, are both available for the Atmel as well as the Cortex-M0. Uh, there are also other proprietary offerings too, such as CMX or AVRX. So a lot of different operating t uh, systems available, a lot of different drivers, and a lot of different uh, compilers available, but pretty much a very much a, almost a one-to-one -one offering as far as 32-bit versus 8-bit. So uh, with regards to looking at the uh, Atmel tools, um, we eventually wound up using the AVR Studio 4.18 Service Pack 3. Um, this is a, a graphical ID that runs on top of a GCC compiler. It has an integrated debugger, uh, supports both the Tiny Mega and XMega devices, does not support the 32-bit AVR devices though. Um, so combining the AVR Studio 4, which is a uh, AVR Studio 4.18 plus Service Pack 1 plus Service Pack 3, you can kind of get up into the 170 or so megabytes or so of installed space. Then on top of that, you need to add the compiler. Now, there are a number of different compilers available. There's the WinAV VR available from SourceForge, as well as the AVR Tool Chain, which is available from Atmel. Uh, what we did notice is that there seems to be an issue with the uh, GCC compiler and the AVR Tool Chain. Once optimizations are turned on, there is a compiler error that gets generated. Uh, so we initially tried it with the AVR tool chain in 4.43 and were unable to get any um, code to compile above optimization level zero. So this required us to go back to the WinAVR tool chain, which is 4.33, and compile there, and that seemed to work out correctly. So. <clears throat> Now, AVR Studio 5, this is a recent release uh, from Atmel. Um, actually, they've now moved from beta to a full-blown release. Um, it does still use the GCC compiler. The version is 4.51. Uh, also, with the integrated debugger, it supports both the 8-bit as well as the 32-bit. But the tool chain now has migrated uh, to a Microsoft Visual Studio shell. And what this means is that the download size has grown significantly. So if you download the version, which also incorporates the Microsoft.NET framework, it is in excess of over 500 megabytes of download size. Now, starting from um, Service Pack 2, uh, Windows XP Service Pack 2, um, you'll have to upgrade to Service Pack 3 in addition to downloading the NET framework with Win imaging components, et cetera, et cetera. And the total install size is 3.2 gigabytes starting from Service Pack 2. So this is quite a considerable installation uh, exercise to undertake. So now compared that to uh, LPC Expresso 3.6, it uses a, a GCC compiler, 4.3.3, along with an Eclipse-based IDE um, based on Eclipse scale layout. Um, 
and it's an open source uh, IDE, um, and it's actually becoming quite popular, so you're going to see more and more people very familiar with the Eclipse IDE interface. 162 megabyte download, and that's it. So it's a single executable. You download it, you run it. We also have a version that runs on Linux as well. So um, if you have any questions, there's also a support forum based on this uh, at um, knowledgebase.nxp.com slash lpcexpresso. So kind of in summary for uh, the migration uh, checklist, uh, basically in order to, uh, the, biggest, the biggest issue is going to be just migration from the hardware. So you're going to have to relay out the PCB in order to accommodate a new 64-pin micro. Um, so essentially reroute the pins, making sure that the spy is connected to the spy, things like that. Uh, firmware development, if you're familiar with uh, GCC tools, it'll be a very, very similar development environment. Um, so there will be should be a small learning curve with that. Um, also, you'll have to migrate some of the driver code primarily, and uh, with that we provide an extensive list of driver code available from our website to implement such things as UART, I squared C, SPI. Um, and so once that migration is taken, so you take the core code, update the peripheral drivers, and with that you get the tremendous improvement in performance over an 8-bit, along with a significant reduction in power consumption and as well as cost savings too uh, with regards to migrating from the 8-bit to the 32-bit. So in summary, I think we've covered uh, both the code density. We get approximately about a 2 to 1 uh, performance improvement in code density. Performance itself has gone up by nearly a factor of 3. Um, active power consumption, megahertz per megahertz, about a factor of two to one improvement. Um, pricing, significantly lower pricing. This is primarily driven by the fact that most 8-bit devices are fabricated in older semiconductor processes. So uh, choosing a 32-bit micro, you get to upgrade to a more uh, modern manufacturing process. The migration, migration path, you know, we do have very similar tool chains with the 8-bit devices. We have the driver code available. Um, we have example code on our website, so um, we've tried to make migration as easy as possible from the 8-bit to the 32-bit. So we, you know, we do have a number of uh, unique features. We do have uh, glitch filters. We have the ability to add additional features to our 32-bit devices. We have uh, high performance, smaller code size, lower cost. And also, with this scalable to the um, higher uh, end Cortex architectures, and I think one thing we didn't really cover is the fact that the code that is developed for Cortex M0 is binary compatible with Cortex M3 and Cortex M4. So, if you wish to migrate upwards to these higher end devices, which add other other features such as DSP uh, arithmetic, such as uh, hardware dividers, things of that nature, you do have this migra migration path available to you. So, so the LPZ zone, you know, kind of where do we get started if we want to do this migration? So, uh, we have the www.nxp.com slash microcontrollers, and this is our MCU homepage. This is where we have all of our data sheets available, the product information pages, user's manuals. Um, we also have uh, training available at LPZ Zone. Um, so this is uh, video training uh, and also product updates are available there. And if you want to get some additional information as far as development tools, both software and hardware-wise, we have www.nxp.com slash lpcexpresso. We have information about our um, LPC link devices, our Expresso boards, as well as the uh, free GCC uh, compiler. And if you're interested in the rapid prototyping environment, we have www.embed.org. What you can see online is a large library of uh, pre-compiled um, functions, you know, LED flashers, some Ethernet demos, things like that, that other people have designed and checked into this uh, database that's available for free download. You can start from there so you don't have to start from scratch. Makes it uh, quite easy to get up and running quickly and then modify your designs as required. And we also have uh, training videos as well too. So we have introduction to the M3, uh, M0, and M4 processors, tools and trip, uh, tricks. Um, we have um, also introduction to some of our higher-end devices, the M4-based 
things and also a getting started introduction to the LPC software development environment. So, and I kind of like to open up for the Q&A section. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, please send those in right now and hopefully we can get those answered for you. All right, and actually we'll have to apologize to everyone. Uh, Keith and I have talked far too long and we've actually consumed our Q&A time. Uh, real quick, uh, I know our apps guys have been answering everything. Uh, the one big thing, can you get this presentation? Uh, yes, it will be available. I believe Jessica can tell us more about that. So we appreciate everyone joining us. Apologize about the Q&A and we need to toss it back to Jessica. Well, thank you, Chris and Keith, for a great presentation. I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, migrating from 8-bit to 32-bit MCUs with NXP LPC 1200, brought to you by NXP and EE Times. Please fill out and submit the survey at this time if you haven't done so already. By completing this survey, you will provide NXP and EE Times with feedback on how we can improve future broadcasts. This presentation will be available shortly in an on-demand format, and as a registered user, you'll receive an email with detailed information on how you can access the on-demand replay of this webinar. The on-demand will also include a PDF copy of the slides used in today's discussion. This webinar is copyright 2011 by EE Times. The presentation materials are owned by our copyright by NXP, which is solely responsible for their content. The individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. We hope you will join us for future webinars. For our current schedule of live and on-demand events, please visit us at eetimes.com. Thanks for joining us.